Well, hey there, everybody, and welcome to yet another uh, ball publishing webinar. I'm Chris Bates, editor of Grower Talks Magazine, Green Profit Magazine, and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we host uh, yet another uh, ball publishing webinar today. It is preventative maintenance and environmental controls in the greenhouse. Uh, now, I am uh, I am not an environmental control expert. Oop, I didn't want to show you that yet. I want to do uh, stop my share. That's what we're doing. Um, what I want to say is, uh, with the winter heat, heating season coming quickly, preventative maintenance is key to ensuring your operation is ready to face the harsh environmental conditions that could affect your greenhouse. And uh, and it's also important to uh, to get ahead of these things because potential issues could cause costly equipment failures. Um, today, we're going to show you how an environmental control computer can help you with this process. And I say we because uh, I am not the expert on this topic. Have you ever noticed I'm never the expert on the topic? In this case, my environmental controls in my Florida greenhouse consisted of two two-stage date and thermostats and a couple of swimming pool time clocks. That's how much I know about environmental controls. But I know who the experts are. And I think, as you can see on your screen, we've got three of them today. And I'm going to introduce them to you. First um, is... Uh, Joan Leonard. Joan is technical specialist with Consolidated Greenhouse Solutions. Welcome, Joan. Hi, hi, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm excellent. Where Where are you broadcasting from today, Joan? I always like I'm, to find out because we could be anywhere on the planet right now. Great. I'm coming to you from Columbus, Ohio. There you go, home of the the Ohio Short Course. Right. So, uh, <laughs> Tell we've well, been around we'll the industry a while. Year, but but every year we usually welcome about. 10 or 12,000 of my uh, best friends to Columbus. Can't wait till we can do it again next year. And what is Consolidated Greenhouse Solutions? So Consolidated Greenhouse Solutions is a team of design specialists. We work with our clients to determine their needs and their requirements and offer an integrated solution to best fit their um, issues. There you go. All right. Next up, we've got, he is CEO of Green Valley Greenhouse. He is Mr. Brad Wolf. Brad, Hello, how are you, Chris. my friend? Good. How are you? Very well. And uh, I'll ask the same question. Where are you broadcasting from today? Uh, broadcasting from Ramsey, Minnesota. It's just north of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Have you had any snow up there yet? No snow yet. <laughs> we we <laughs> haven't had some, some light frost so far. Uh, that's, uh, you're, a, you're a tougher man than me to live up there near Frostbite <laughs> Falls. But, uh, but uh, you're, you're CEO of Green Valley Greenhouses. In a nutshell, tell me about Green Valley. How big a place and what do you grow? Okay, we are 22 acres of covered space, and we primarily grow seasonal potted plants. Seasonal potted plants. That's a, that's a crop you don't see so many growers doing these days. You've got to have a really good environmental control system to do that stuff. That's what I grew in Florida. Pot mums, poinsettias. Didn't tackle East, Easter lilies. That's too scary for a Florida grower. <laughs> anyway, we'll get more into that later. Last, but hardly least, least, from our sponsor, Argus, is Mr. Rico Garay, Key Account Manager. Welcome, Rico. Uh, hi there, everyone. How's it going? Great to have you here. And, uh, and where are you broadcasting from in that uh, snappy Argus hat? So, uh, actually, not too far from Brad. I'm in uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota. All right, but Argus is not based in Minnesota, right? You're... No, Argus is actually based out of uh, Surrey in uh, British Columbia. BC, exactly right. But now what part of the country do you cover as key accounts manager? The whole, the whole place and Canada? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I actually do. I cover all of uh, the United States and Canada, and I work with uh, different people who are uh, channel partners with Argus. All right. So when it says key accounts, I imagine that's some pretty big, important greenhouse operations. You, you hook them up with uh, make sure their environmental controls are working. So I suspect you know a whole lot about this topic today. He's, and he's not going to say, of course I do. I'm a genius. <laughs> but he is. I can tell you he is. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do one more thing here. I'm going to, uh, people always ask, um, is, uh, is, uh, is there a way to, to watch this again? Or I have to leave halfway through. I have already had a few emails this morning from people who, who, um, who said, I can't make the webinar. I got something going on, but can I watch it later? And uh, yes, you can. The webinar will be archived 
at the usual spot. In fact, you ought to put a post-it note on your desk. Go to growertalks.com slash webinars. You can find all of the archives and any upcoming webinars that we've got going on as well. So let me stop that share right there because we're going to dive right into it now. Um, with, with the first question, um, you know, you'd kind of wonder, why do we even need to talk about preventative maintenance? Because everybody knows, everybody does preventative maintenance. You know, it's just a routine part of being a greenhouse operator. Right, Brad? Or is that wrong? Because when we were talking about this before, I wrote this quote down because I'm a journalist. Nobody does it. That's what you said, Brad, when it came to preventative maintenance. Explain that, would you? Yeah, I will try to. It's a comment that's been shared with me from other people, and I really should correct it. No one does maintenance. <laughs> and that's, I'm, I'm laughing, but it's, 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 it's more true than I'd like to believe it to be. But uh, th this is kind of one area, your, your heating for us, particularly we're focused on the heating. And it is, we have to, we do have to test things. And I think it's, it's kind of one area where we do, it does get our attention because it is very critical when we get down to zero or below. But is it only because you're in a really tough climate that, that, that you pay special attention to it? What about a North Carolina grower or somebody in a little more mild spot? You think they're a little more lax about making sure everything's working and then, and then they're, they spend all their time fixing things instead of preventing having to fix them? Well, they, I'm sure they, they awful. I'm, I'm sure they all also have very uh, critical times where they, 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 they can't afford a hiccup, uh, probably more in ventilation, perhaps. But uh, I would also say that uh, we have a little less time to work with when it does go out because the, the outdoor temperature really does change the conditions rapidly. Yeah, and your starts up early. I mean, you're already talking mild frost and we'll talk a little bit more about how that impacts how you do things. Joan, what's your experience with, uh, with clients and, and how readily and proactively they do preventative maintenance versus just fixing things when they're, when they're broken or when it's obvious? We run into everything. We have some folks that they're very good on the preventative maintenance and others that are sort of like Brad that, you know, it, it pops up and you have to deal with it when you have to deal with it. But I can tell you prior to working for CGS, I was at the Ohio State University greenhouses for 31 years and preventative maintenance was a real important part of our plan because we couldn't afford to have any time that was down a lot of the research project was very um, high dollar cost of the research that if we lost those plants, those were the only plants in the world of them. And we didn't could afford to be losing plants due to a breakdown. Right. Well, I think that's the case for no matter how, I mean, I had a half acre greenhouse and boy, if I'd lost my crop, I'm on the street, you know, Rico, what's, what's your experience with, with clients, especially those key clients. I imagine, are they, are you think they're, are they better at preventative maintenance than, you know, the average, you know, bomb and pop operation like I was? Or, or do they get so busy running that 22 acre place like Brad that they find it kind of slips through the cracks? You know, uh, I guess I have fairly mixed reviews on that. Um, a lot of it really comes down to understanding what needs to be maintained. And also uh, a lot of it has to do with environmental conditions. You know, obviously the more harsh environment that you find yourself in, the more that you think about that maintenance, because if you have a critical piece of equipment go down during a super hot season or a super cold season, it obviously affects uh, your ability to produce your crops. So. Uh, where if you're in a more mild or temperate climate, usually it's a little bit, uh, you don't think about it as much because you're, you're kind of saved a little bit by the outside temperature. Yeah. Now we talked um, a little bit about timing. Um, Brad, I mean, you've already had a frost up there. What do you think, Brad, is like the, the optimum timing to, to plan your preventative maintenance and then we're going to get more into the details of preventative maintenance audit and exactly what that is. But based on, uh, on, uh, on your experience, Brad, what's the best timing for, for doing these things? Okay. Yeah, Chris, uh, what I would say is that it kind of follows the calendar as, as it would. And just by convention, we typically deal with our, our heating issues in June that, that may, maybe we've come into June and we we're finally, the heating system is off and we've got some major work, that's the time to start working on it for the summer. Then I would say the next time is just right now, September. We, 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 do a, we do a, try to do a check because we've got to get the, the systems back up. 
it's good. We have these kind of cooler nights that kind of give us some test runs. And then when we get in, before we get into the real, what, what we call the guts of the heating system, which would be January, February, March, we have someone come in November usually and do a final tune up of our boilers. And by then things should have, we should have ironed out most everything by November. That's a, so a three part process in your case. Now that one back in June, is that only for doing like major known repairs, upgrades, things like that? Or, or are you actually testing and checking out the system preparatory to your, to your winter heating system? Right. That, that, that would be primarily re, re, replacing boiler relief valves, um, checking boilers for leaks and getting them, the tubes welded. Kind of those major things that maybe you kind of, you know, you finished up the heating season on four flat tires and it's time to really, <laughs> you know, take, take some action, get, get some of the things that you were working around and making it happen. But now it's time to address them and, and get them done because if you don't, they'll, they'll get off the, the schedule and you'll, you'll be disappointed in August when everybody else is trying to do it and you can't find someone to come out and do it. That's another point too. We'll, we'll mention it uh, briefly, but Joe, what's, what's your, what's your view on, on timing? What do you recommend to clients? Right. We will look at your production schedule, find out when you have the least amount of plants in the greenhouse and that you can actually take that greenhouse down to make those major repairs um, before you have to take those, <laughs> that greenhouse down for major repairs. You don't want to be doing those major repairs when you have a full house. So um, trying to identify those times. When I was at the university, usually summer break was a great time. Winter break was a good time. Spring break, um, we didn't have so many classes to service. Um, spring was always a little tight because I think it's tight with everybody in space um, getting ready uh, for, for this semester there. But um, trying to identify those times in your schedule. Your greenhouse might not be completely empty, but when you can kind of consolidate some things and, and then get access, there's nothing worse than trying to unload a bench full of plants so you can move the bench so you can set up a ladder to try to get up to the vent to the ceiling to make sure something's working so just yeah. identify the best times to be able to get in there yeah now now rico brad mentioned something about you know you wait until you, you sort of the kind of the beginning of the season and you call your guy and he's booked out for three months in advance now so what is there's another benefit to doing it kind of what seems early but it's it's you're available, right? And the other technicians, the heating technicians are available. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, yeah that's absolutely super important. I mean, everybody uh, who works for any company is gonna have different schedules that go around essentially their flow of work. So if you think about like a heating system, well, they're gonna be likely the least busy during the summertime. Uh, and then also if you're testing your heating system during the summertime, you're testing it during a time when you really don't need to utilize it. So it's not, if there is any kind of uh, maintenance that needs to be done or even some type of part, for example, that maybe has a longer lead time, you'll have a real leg up on that if you test it in the off season. Uh, you can do the same thing with like your exhaust fans in the uh, winter time, especially your larger exhaust fans towards the base of your greenhouse. You're not going to be running those as much in the winter time, so it'd be good for you to check things like your bearings and your belts and all of that. And make sure that that's ready to go for when you do need it in the summer. So. All right, all right. We've talked about um, you need to do it. We know we need to do it, but sometimes we, you know, we get busy. We always get busy. Um, talk about when to do it. Some of the good timing options. Um, how, what's how do you make sure that it gets done? Brad, you seem pretty good at that. <laughs> well. I have a lot of room for improvement, for sure. But I, I think it's, um, it's, it's probably on your mind a lot. I mean, even during the summer, we're trying to turn on our pumps, turn on our valves, and, and just keep them from locking up. And just so you, you kind of, you, you're, you're, you're always trying to think about it and, and think about the, the, the components that you struggled with last season and, and try to address it if you can. And I, I think, you know, I guess one thing I'd like to say that really helps us is, is I think over time we've developed a really good team of individuals that are contractors, but they really can assist you in, in doing those kind of tasks, not only doing them, but, but keeping them on your radar because they're interested in doing the work. And I think that, that helps as well. Yeah. So now a place like you, I would think would have, you know, a, a big in-house 
maintenance department or at least decent size, but you depend on, on outside contractors for their, their expertise, right? We, we, we do in specific trade skills. We do, we do have our own in-house people and uh, our, our in-house people also do other tasks in the greenhouse as well. So, but, but for the, for the high level, like I would say like an electrician and a heating and air conditioning person, you, you need, I, I feel like you need someone that, that really understands the, those industries. Yeah, all right. So they can help remind you too. It's like give a phone call or an email. Hey, it's time to run through your system. Let's talk about those systems, Joan. What, I mean, I know we're talking, you know, heat because it's going into the winter, but, but we will, we are addressing Southern growers as well, who are, you know, dealing more with summertime heat and things like that. But what systems do you need to make sure you're looking at um, and why? Right. So it's, it's all the components, all the equipment that is operating the environments in your greenhouse. So, you know, obviously heat, because we're talking about heat right now, but it can be fans, it can be pumps, um, solenoids on your heat valves. So maybe your heat is working great, but the solenoid that opens up the valve isn't working or the actuator is bad. So um, identifying all, not just the systems, but the components of those systems and then making sure that um, each of those is working. And this is where the environmental control system is very handy in um, being able to make checks of, you know, is that equipment working? First of all, is it turning on and off as it should? And then is it running optimally? So if you have a fan, is it running the correct CFMs out of it? Are you getting the right BTUs out of your heater? Uh, and we're going to, that's almost a good segue. I want to go down to Rico and, and ask you, Rico, what, what components tend to get forgotten about when you're looking at your big boiler or the, you know, the unit heaters hanging there, what tends to, um, to break because somebody forgot to check it? Anything? Uh, I think a really common one is uh, valves. You know, valves are really only going to have a, a certain shelf life depending on the valve manufacturer. And then another thing that you actually will commonly see from the control side is that because a lot of control systems have uh, manual overrides, whether that be physically at the panel or even often through the software, sometimes some of the issues that people run into that I guess sort of isn't necessarily maintenance related, but they'll put it into manual and forget about it. And then all of a sudden they'll get tons of alarms and not really realize what's going on there. So, but uh, I would say in general, from a maintenance perspective, uh, valves is a very common one. And then if you think about uh, exhaust fans, uh, belts, bearings, things like that. Yeah. Okay. Now, so let's make that segue now, Joan, that you, that you made for us. And that is, where does the environmental control computer come into all this? Uh, and in fact, I even, as I said, my environmental controls was two, two stage Dayton thermostats. So I was fascinated to learn what a, an environmental control computer, you know, something that is more than just a thermostat can actually do for you. So talk about that, Rico. Give us an introduction. Rico? Yeah, yep, yeah, no, absolutely, sorry. That's a big, I hit you with a big question there, I, I, know. Was, I know. I was looking at one of the questions there, the Q&A, so uh, oh, yeah, if you, if you wanna pull up uh, some of those slides that we had uh, put together, I think this would probably be a good way to explain certain things. Right, so. okay, let's see. We did have some, uh, some graphs available here. I'm gonna do a quick screen share. There we go. So when you think about uh, your preventative maintenance, uh, some of the things that you really want to take a look at are uh, your alarms and then your trends. So this is an example of a couple of greenhouse environments, and the different parameters that you're looking to hit. So we have temperature, humidity, CO2, so on and so forth. And uh, one of those, it's like the temperature one, is in a level three alarm. So you want to figure out what is that level three alarm? And then most importantly, how frequently does that level three alarm seem to happen? because that may give you an indication that some pieces of equipment uh, are not doing uh, so well. If you go on to the next slide here, another thing that you want to keep a constant uh, look at is uh, your data trends in general and how they show up on the graphs. So with uh, some of the graphing features that you can have with a lot of environmental control systems, you can get an idea of how you're doing in comparison to hitting your, your set point parameters. So you may have a set point parameter of I don't know, it's uh, throughout a, like a 70 degree, uh, you know, uh, Fahrenheit temperature. 
and you want to take a look at how you're performing on that uh, in comparison against your set point. And if you know, if you see uh, something odd in the data where you're seeing a really weird spike or a very odd temperature spike, uh, you know that you may have a piece of equipment that's down. So that'll give you a really good indication of, um, you know, anything that may need to have some type of maintenance done on it. All right. Those Brad, are you've, you've seen, I'm sorry, didn't interrupt Rico. I didn't mean to. Um, Brad, I was going to say, you've seen these graphs. Talk, talk about them from, uh, from your perspective, how you use uh, environmental, uh, your environmental controls for your, well, we want to get the word audit out there, I think, because that's, that's what really threw me off too. I don't like an audit. That means the IRS is showing up or something. But talk about, Brad, what is an environment, uh, a, a, a preventative maintenance audit? Well, uh, I would just say in terms of what Rico has showed us with these graphs, uh, having an environmental control system like this is really a super tool because this allows you to have eyes in your greenhouse 24 seven. You can actually see when, what the temperature is actually doing and, and what, what you need to do to maybe fine tune either your, your temperature set points or how you're running the equipment. And I think these graphs, once you kind of get an eye for what you want in your graphs and, and train your eye to see them, you can, you can really diagnose what's happening without having to sit in the greenhouse all night. Is it more than just a, a temperature graph or a set point showing, you know, my greenhouse was, was only 60 instead of, you know, the 65 I wanted. Is there a lot more detail than that that really helps you pinpoint what's, what's going on? Absolutely, because you can create the graph the way you want it. You can add your, your shade curtains into it. You can add venting. You can add uh, times that your, your, your pumps were on, times your pumps were off, the, the mixing valve settings and percentages. And all that to say is that creates a very uh, clear picture of what's happening. Uh, you can manage your temperature differential that way. You can, you can also just plain... Uh, see if you're having a problem not holding temperature. Okay, Joan, you're nodding. Talk about what uh, how you uh, your your customers use these these right. well, uh, absolutely. charts and graphs. We we recommend that they're every day you're checking in and checking your graphs and having a pulse on what's going on. It's a quick snapshot to take a look, and you'll see immediately if something's falling out of range. And you can start to address that. So if some, if you have really low temperature in your greenhouse, you know, is the boiler down or is it just a valve? Is it just in one greenhouse room? Is it and it's other zones are affected? So you can really pinpoint where some of the issues are very quickly by looking at this graphical data. Enrico, you had mentioned uh, another way to use uh, the environmental control beyond uh, graphing, looking for an anomaly on the, on the, on the graph, and that is um, time, putting in, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the hours of, uh, you know, motors or what have you. Talk about that. I thought that was pretty Yeah, cool. absolutely. Uh, the runtime feature is a, a super important piece of environmental control systems. Essentially what it allows you to do is it allows you to keep a constant timer of when certain pieces of equipment are on. So, and this uh, is, and what you really can do is furthermore tie that into an alarm. So um, for example, let's say uh, you purchase some supplemental lights that have uh, X amount of runtime that they're allowed to be on, let's say 2000 hours or something like that. Okay, you can actually set that as a runtime within an environmental control system uh, and then actually have the control system send you an alarm when you're reaching that parameter, which would be 2000 hours in this case. So, so yeah, so, I, so in other words, if, now, I don't know if you do that with valves and things, but there have to be a lot of pieces of equipment around the greenhouse where you know, hey, we ought to replace these or at least take a look at them after a certain number of hours. And so that's how you would, you would use that. It would remind you basically that, hey, your valves are getting old or your belts need replacing or something. Yep. Pumps is another one you can utilize it for. That's another good one to, to be able to put on a run timer. Uh, and then obviously any piece of critical equipment. Uh, and really what you're doing is you're tying that back into your alarm. So if you uh, want to show the... Uh, next uh, slide that we had uh, put together. Yeah, hang on, let's go ahead and, and uh, share that. Uh, one, 
Yeah, absolutely. One of the other uh, super important things about environmental control systems is that they have the ability to uh, alarm uh, different uh, potential things that could be going on inside of uh, your greenhouse. So uh, first thing you want to probably establish are what are your critical pieces of equipment? Um, good examples of that would be like transport pumps on boilers is going to be a pretty critical piece of equipment. Uh, a motor on a uh, exhaust fan, if you're in a, a very hot climate, is going to be a critical piece of equipment. Uh, perhaps a pad, uh, pad wall pump is also another critical piece of equipment. And uh, what you can do is you can put run times on those, which is always, uh, I think, super important. But the other thing that you can also do is do use something as simple as like a current switch, which basically tells you if there is current or not current in that piece of equipment. And you can tie that into uh, a critical alarm. So uh, environmental control systems have the ability to do different things when you get alarms. Sometimes alarms just pop up on the screen. Uh, sometimes alarm can, an alarm can send you a text message. And then sometimes uh, alarms can actually be automated to send you essentially a robocall. So once you have an uh, understanding of what are your critical pieces of equipment, you can tie that into a critical alarm, something that would likely send you a phone call, whether it happens at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then there's other things that are going to go on inside your greenhouse that maybe are a little more common. You don't want it necessarily waking you up in the middle of the night, but you do want to know that it's happening. So maybe with that, you get an email or a text message, or, or maybe it just uh, flashes on the screen. So um, utilizing uh, runtime and understanding critical pieces of equipment and tying them into alarms is a super crucial part of utilizing an environmental control system. All right, I pop to the next slide. Don't know if I should have, but it says alarm optimization through customization. Does that tie into that topic? Exactly, it's really just uh, talking about a lot of the stuff that I had just mentioned with the different okay. uh, levels and priorities. So uh, obviously have a good understanding of what's critical, what's not critical, and then uh, plan for it accordingly within the environmental control system. All right, and Brad, you said something that I thought was pretty interesting when we were talking earlier, and that is that, um, it's like having a, it's a, it's like having a pair of eyes in every nook and cranny of your greenhouse. And with 22 acres, um, it's probably pretty hard to keep up with every piece of equipment, no matter how diligent you are in preventative maintenance. So, how does your environmental control computer allow you to have those those eyes everywhere? Right. Well, kind of like what Rico and Joan have mentioned, the uh, the customization of that environmental control system really helps you hone in on what's important to you uh, and, and, and allows you to really um, track it. And again, I, I keep kind of re repeating this, but the, the pictorial display of that in a graph is just so very helpful because you, you, can, you can reference that graph a year ago, a month ago. Uh, you, you can do a historical account of those graphs and really, really get, a, I think, a clear picture of, of, of how your growing environment is behaving. <laughs> and and even kind of understand why your plants are doing what they're doing all right um and brad talk to a little bit about the the, the notion of the audit so it, it sort of sounds to me like it kind of formalizes the way you go through your your graphs and the environmental controls looking for these these issues and and checking to make sure everything's working properly how is it different than an audit different than just preventative maintenance well, I'm not sure I know exactly how to answer that, but I would say that the the graphs each I think each grower develops the own their own set of graphs of what they're interested in in seeing, and uh, those they would check probably on a daily basis, just like I think Joanne Joan mentioned that, and I think that's important to do certain graphs, look at them every day to see what's going on, and then I would just say uh, on the preventative side. Um, again, I, I think we, as a, our own group, struggles a little bit with that, and, and we're, we're more into seeing why the problem is happening probably too late, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, Joan, you want to add to that a little bit? Sure. I am, the audit, in addition to, you know, checking that the equipment is turning on and off and, and operating as it should, I think some of the other things you want to look at is 
as especially as seasons change, um, look at your set points and look at your alarms, um, because often when the season changes, we want to kind of make sure that those are changing as well. Um, and also the um, system that your your um, software, your control software is running on, check your PC, you know, is it eight years old? <laughs> you might want to think about upgrading that. Um, you know, technology uh, moves quickly. So make sure that your, your system is um, supported so it doesn't go down. Um, firmware updates is another area that you might want to uh, make sure that, you know, your software is the most up-to-date version that it can be. Yeah. It can also help you, I think, as you applied, going from one season to the, or one crop to the next, as you change crops, right. remembering to change either the set points or, you know, just the environment that that crop is going to get. So. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Rico, what's, uh, okay. Um, I'm wondering, do I have to have a massive, I've seen some of those Argus boxes. I mean, they're, you know, the size of small houses. How extensive an environmental control computer do I have to have to take advantage of this, especially if I'm a smaller grower? Well, uh, I think a lot of it depends on uh, how much you want to be able to utilize the functionality through software. So, and also the idea of fully integrated versus uh, more of like a step controller sort of prepackaged control system. Um, and it really is going to come down to your price point and what you're looking uh, to, to be able to utilize your control system for. So systems like Argus controls are fully integrated, meaning that the intention of an Argus control system is really to control anything and everything that makes up uh, that growing environment. And we often take on, you know, irrigation and nutrient injection as a part of our scope and, and everything else too. Um, so when you have systems like that, uh, you're going to be able to get a whole lot of data about what's going on with everything within your grow facility because it's plugged into everything in your grow facility. Um, however, you can acquire the same type of information uh, through more step controller type uh, offerings, which are really kind of prepackaged and really focused on specific things in a greenhouse. You may have a step controller that's uh, utilized for just your irrigation stuff. You may have a step controller that's really just utilized for opening your vents and kicking on exhaust fans. Um, and although you can get a lot of the same information, it's in basically different areas. So you may have to go into this controller to take a look and see what's going on uh, with your vents and your exhaust fans. You may have to go into this controller and take a look at what's going on with your irrigation cycles and then kind of try to cross-reference those and see if there's anything that you need to, to think about um, as far as optimizing your controls. On the fully integrated side, since you're going to have all that data there, you can really sort of pick and choose what you think, um, uh, what you think uh, might make sense from a correlation perspective of you know, this seems to be going on whenever I do this, or this seems to be going on, or I'm not getting enough of this whenever I go and, and try to do this in my greenhouse, so on and so forth. But really having a software platform is, a, is I think, a, a, a good starting place. So having a control system with a software platform is good. And then having a, a control system that actually trends data. I know we've talked a lot about uh, data today, but uh, to both uh, Brad and, and, and Joan's uh, points, uh, Really, you kind of should always start and end your day with the graphs of what's going on. How, how is my data trending? Am I uh, doing a good job of hitting my step points? Uh, when I tend to do this in the greenhouse, like water, for example, how is that affecting uh, my relative humidity? Is there anything that I can do to be able to uh, do, get a little bit less spikes within my relative humidity as I do things like water? Um, when I, uh, you can also do similar things with like your shading. So for example, in the winter time, you may choose to close your shade to create a thermal blanket instead of do things like kick on unit heaters or kick on boilers and things like that. So um, the more data you have and the more that you're able to look at that and correlate it to different pieces of equipment turning on and off, uh, that's going to help you to really understand your preventative maintenance. And that's ultimately what you really want to do when you do a system audit is take a look at what each individual, uh, take a look at all of the individual pieces of equipment that are making up your system. How are they affecting your graphs? And how can you optimize the use of that equipment to get basically a less choppy graph or get as close to perfect on your environmental parameters as possible? All right. Um, now, I was gonna get into the, 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 the consequences of not doing all of this, but I, do, I think everybody understands 
that it only takes, you know, your boiler going out one time during a free, and they always go out when it's really like the coldest possible. Why is that, Brad? Because it's working so hard, probably. But we know the cost of not doing an, uh, an environmental audit, right? Definitely, definitely. When and and we've had our like 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 you were saying, Chris. Every uh, grower has their horror stories and their hall of shame that they can go to of uh, what they didn't do. But it does it does wake you up and literally at night, and then it also wakes you up as to you know what what you should have as far as re replacement parts and and backup plans and and what kind of options do you have in your system that can can have, have you give you a workaround at least for the evening hours and then maybe take it on during the day. Mm -hmm. now, now, now you mentioned uh, you have something called a curtailment procedure that your environmental control kind of helps you out with, which I found, which I found interesting. Talk about that. Yes. Uh, we are uh, on a, we, we buy our natural gas on an interruptible basis so that we get a better pricing. And, but that does mean that if the gas company needs us to go off gas for a while, that we have to have a backup fuel source. In our case, that is uh, number two heating oil. And our, our boilers can switch off onto that, but it does take uh, a, a bit of doing to do it. But it is good that the environmental control systems can, can, can modulate with that. It's, it's not like we have to do a lot of different things. Uh, but we, we do try to have, we do try to go over that uh, procedure and make sure we're ready to go. Okay. And, and Rico kind of tied in with that a little bit. Uh, you mentioned um, generator mode. Um, there's something an environmental control uh, computer can have set into it. Talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. And it really goes beyond just generators too. Really what I'm talking about is what's called a conditional control. So a conditional control is basically you have this way in which your control system normally operates, but under this condition, so in this case, it could be like a generator kicking on, uh, we actually will change the way in which the environmental control system uh, would choose to act. So in the example of a generator, you know, your power's going down. So when the generator kicks on, power's coming back, back up you may choose to uh, utilize the way in which you operate your facility uh, very different when you're on generator power than when you're on your main power source. Uh, some of the reasons for that is depending on the capabilities of your generator, it may or may not have uh, enough power to actually run everything uh, that's in your greenhouse. So then you sort of have to pick and choose. Like if you're in a really hot climate, uh, you're obviously going to utilize, you're going to prioritize the use of your cooling equipment, like your patent fan system, or if you're a sealed greenhouse, maybe you're using hydronic uh, fan coils or something like that. Uh, you're going to prioritize that over your supplemental lighting when it pertains to the amount of energy that you're looking to use. Um, the other thing that you sometimes will run into with uh, generator systems is that sometimes generator systems take a while to ramp up or to ramp down. So then you may choose to do, uh, to do different things or kick on different pieces of equipment based on how long it takes for your generator to actually reach full capacity. Uh, and in the example with, um, that Brad gave with uh, switching over to a different boiler system, uh, you know, if, should you choose to do that and should we have feedback from the Argus system, we can build in conditional controls for uh, different things going on within a, a, a greenhouse. Uh, and oftentimes what you do is you take in what's called a fault signal or uh, just a, an input into the Argus that uh, essentially puts in an override sequence that causes uh, a whole different uh, array of things to happen within your, your greenhouse. Yeah. We've, we've, uh, we've talked a lot about making sure all your equipment, heaters, fans, vents, pumps, valves, et cetera, are working properly. How do we know our environmental control is working properly and giving us good information is there an, does it do an audit on itself you know that's a, a really good question so you can set up uh, certain things uh, within the uh, environmental control system to send you alarms when uh, sensors seem to be falling out of uh, calibration a really common one that uh, Argus will do is uh, with an Argus uh, Omni sensor it will also come with a backup temperature sensor so uh, we can we set up a program with most systems where if your uh, omni sensor temperature reading, which is our aspirated uh, sensor that goes in the middle of the greenhouse, 
if the temperature reading from that has a bigger difference than you know five degrees or whatever we set it to from your backup temperature sensor you know that that sensor is starting to fall out of calibration uh, and usually you tie that into an alarm uh, other than that i mean that's really the main thing that you're going to need to do substantial maintenance on and, and what you would really be worried about from your environmental control system is just getting in uh, poor sensor readings and the best way to test against that uh, from the environmental side is probably just to use a handheld sensor and compare what you're getting from your handheld sensor versus what you're getting from Argus. The only caution I would say to that is you need to make sure when you do that that you're comparing things that are apples to apples. So the Argus sensor is going to be an aspirated sensor, meaning there's a small fan that's inside of the sensor that draws in sample air. So you would want to make sure that whatever sensor you're utilizing on, at, you know, at your ground level there, your handheld is also an aspirated sensor. And then you also want to tie that into what are called tolerances or basically the performance specs of the sensor. So you want to make sure that your handheld sensor has similar performance specs to the Argus sensor. Otherwise, you're really comparing apples and oranges. Um, the other thing I guess you could do as far as maintenance is you could go through with like a, a multimeter and just make sure that all of the electrical signals from the output cards are firing. So if you have uh, like a digital signal, it's likely going to be a 24 volt signal. So you want to go and check and make sure that all of your uh, that all of your digital cards are putting out 24 volts. Your analog cards are able to put out zero to 10 volts, things like that. So if you're finding that that's not the case, then you may know that hey, I've got a faulty output card. All right, Brad, has that ever been an issue for the for you though, or you pretty much uh, uh, set it and forget it when it comes to your uh, your Argus system? Well, I think uh, just uh, each each season you have to kind of look at. The different parameters yeah and i, I i'd say we've been very hands-off it, it's 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 very reliable and the, the equipment has, has, has performed very well and um, not too many issues i would say yeah okay all right and rico we've been kind of focused on heating and um, brad's up there in frostbite falls i assume this all pertains to our southern friends uh as well who who have to probably uh cool a whole lot more than Brad might and also have to worry about freezes uh, as well. Are there, is there anything different for a, a Southern grower than there would be for, uh, for a Minnesota grower? Uh, I would say the main difference is really your critical pieces of equipment. So, you know, we've talked about critical pieces of equipment from a heating standpoint, mostly pertaining to like to the boiler. Um, if you're a southern grower, a lot of your critical pieces of equipment are really going to be based around cooling. So if you're doing, you know, a pad and fan system, for example, you want to make sure that the pump that feeds your wet wall is, uh, is working properly, that you're changing out your cooling pads, things like that. Um, when on your uh, exhaust side, you want to make sure that your motors on your exhaust fans are good, your belts are good, your bearings are good. Um, if you're doing like a high pressure mist system, for example, that also will have uh, a pump and then also uh, likely a solenoid valve. So you want to make sure that those solenoid valves aren't sticking, that they're, uh, you know, working properly and that your pump is able to get to the right pressure to create like a high pressure mist. Um, then, you know, taking a look at things like your vents and your shades are going to be really, really important to making sure that you don't have any uh, snags with any of those motors. So. Uh, all really sort of the same stuff, but you're really just focused on critical pieces of equipment, which are going to be different from region to region. Sure. And the timing for when you would be doing these things might be flip-flopped. Yep. What, what Brad will be doing as well. But that makes, that makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. <clears throat> Joan, any last words on, on uh, how growers can make better use of environmental controls? What you recommend to your clients, for, for instance, especially smaller ones who, you know, I mean... What can a little guy do to get into this world of being able to, to, to chart and graph uh, my, my environmental conditions? Right. Well, I think one thing that you also need to address is the ability to remotely access your system. Um, it's one thing to get a call in the middle of the night, drive 10 miles, get to the site, take care of things. But I know I've run into situations where I've been out of town and of course that's a holiday weekend or something and that's when the heat goes down, right? So I'm able to log in remotely um, to the system, monitor things. I can call somebody to come out, a technician to come out or a contractor to come out, take a look at that boiler and see what's going on. So I, I, I don't wanna, uh, I, I want to encourage that, you know, you consider that 
that's, you know, another set of ears and eyes, <laughs> you know, being able to, to handle things remotely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. We've got, um, we've got one question so far that's coming from the uh, outside. This is from Joseph, who is, asks, how important, and I'm not sure what this is, PID settings. How important are PID settings for having your heating system run optimally for controlling your greenhouse temperature? Rico, you want to handle that? First, tell me what a PID setting is. I probably know and just can't figure it out. Yeah, so PID stands for proportional integral and derivative, which is uh, it's I do definitely know yeah, it's definitely control jargon. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, and to answer, uh, I think it's Joseph's uh, question. Um, it's extremely important. Uh, you're constantly going to be uh, making tweaks to that, especially as your heating loads change. Um, what PNIDs really do is they um, take a look at uh, different responses based on your sensor input. So uh, as you see your temperatures uh, get colder and also get colder quickly, you're going to have to have a different response time to your ability to heat than when uh, it's just consistently cold. So taking a, a, a monitor on a lot of those uh, PNIDs is definitely something that's super important. So. All right. Uh, tell us again what PID is. Uh, proportional, integral, and derivative. So, gotcha. yeah, it's basically uh, a lot of it just comes down to uh, how your control system responds. So, uh, you know, proportional would be the exact response that it has. Integral would be the response that it has over a time period. And then uh, the derivative would be uh, basically how often it's uh, not hitting the response. It's kind of a good way to explain that. So, All right. Good. We learn something new every day. Brad knew that, though I could tell. <laughs> Brad, any any last words to the growers out there about um, kind of um, you know the importance of of taking your your maintenance maybe a little I would call this kind of to the next level in a way. Right. I I think uh, just even having this conversation today has even got me more motivated to get out there and, and do a little more than what we've, we've done. But I, I just think that, uh, you know, keep working on developing a, a team of people in your organization that has concern about it. And I think that's really helping us. And it's just, it, it is so important to develop these relationships with, with your technical experts. Um, you know, Joan mentioned, I, I picked up on it when she said I could then call someone in to take care of it and having people that are, that are committed to helping you out at all hours of the night is a real key part of this because things do go wrong. Even when you do good preventative maintenance, things happen and they particularly seem to happen when the weather gets really cold and, and things don't want to work as well. And, uh, it's just so good to have a, a team of people you can call and even if it's just troubleshooting some ideas and, and discussing what are our options because people look at things differently and that's a real strength if you can develop that. Peace of mind. Joan, how about you? Um, yeah, I have to just mirror uh, what Brad had said is like the peace of mind is really um, you can sleep at night <laughs> and you're not worrying, am I going to make it through the night, you know, um, or, you know, spending the night at the greenhouse yourself, um, making sure that, you know, nothing goes down. So it's really right. peace of mind. All right. And Rico, you want to wrap up with any last messages for, uh, for, the, for our audience out there? Uh, <clears throat> really, again, mirroring what uh, uh, Brad and Jonah just said, um, the more thought that you put into planning ahead for your maintenance and understanding the equipment and mechanical systems that allow you to heat, cool, uh, dehumidify, uh, you know, put on light, whatever it is that goes on in your in your facility, and knowing the having a maintenance schedule and looking at the data trends and run times to understand uh, what maintenance may need to be coming in the future just helps you to uh, be a lot less stressed out when you're on your facility. It helps you to sleep at night and it also helps you to understand and, and plan for your budgeting for the future uh, too, because you know, you may need to make improvements as you continue to grow 
uh, as a grower. And those are all things that you need to understand. And uh, environmental control systems can help you to do that. Questions have come in. Um, Pamela wants to know, and, and she said, I kind of started in on this, and maybe I needed to follow up a little bit more, and that is what can a smaller grower do who's on a budget, who wants to, to begin using this technology but doesn't have the, the budget for a full-fledged integrated uh, computer control, or maybe a full-fledged integrated control system isn't as uh, expensive as we think it is. How would you get into started with this technology? Joan, what would you advise? So we work with the client and find out, first of all, what their needs and requirements are. You might want to just start with one or two zones initially, and um, maybe just a few pieces of equipment that are critical pieces of equipment, and then expand from there. So you can always be adding more um, IO modules or more output cards and input cards as your facility grows. And in addition to, um, as you, if you wanted to just expand what you already have. So you can start fairly small and um, gradually through phases, uh, expand throughout more of your facility and more pieces of equipment. Brass tags, I know you'll say in tens, but what do I have to budget? So initially, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got one acre greenhouse. I'll start. I'll, start. I'll give you that much. Great. Great. So one acre greenhouse um, can be different from site to site. So um, your critical systems, if you wanted to start with your boiler systems, you could just do boiler systems and heat valves initially. And then if you wanted to move to the cooling equipment, you could do your ventilation, your pad and fan systems, your HAFs, your lights. So those are all the systems you could expand into. And what's your it cost me to get started? started? It depends on the number of <laughs> It does because um, you know, do you it, it it's it's all based on the number of, of pieces of equipment that you're going to be controlling. So are you just gonna do one valve or are you doing ten valves? You know, that's that's the difference. Rico, can you can you can arrow arrow in on it on Pamela wants to buy a size this is just not sure that more at well, have her give me a call. We'll work on it. <laughs> I did what I did. What I did. Uh, and I've got I've got one of these. Oh, I've got a couple of questions left coming here. Let's see what we've got here. Um, how was my sound? Sound says I'm getting on getting odd sounds. Am I okay? Okay. It's a little fuzzy. Yeah, Chris, you're you're not coming through too clear. You're 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 very garbled on my device. All right. All right. All right. Uh, there, that'll be better now. This microphone will work for an hour and a half and then it says, forget it, I'm gonna start garbling you. Sorry about that, uh, Andrew, thanks for letting me know. Uh, let's see, Celeste asks, uh, is there any, way, any maintenance that should be done on the Omni sensor uh, for Titan users or the Argus box for classic users? Uh, referring to the sensor boxes that hang in the greenhouse. So where those sensors are, you know, the, the temperature sensors and things. Any, any maintenance there? Uh, from the Argus side, the most important piece of that would just be to make sure that you're cleaning out the filter. So there's a small filter that uh, is right before uh, basically where it draws in the sample layer. So make sure that your filters are, are uh, clean from time to time, but otherwise it's uh, fairly maintenance free. All right, that's good to know. Uh, Rachel wants to know, let's see, is there, um, is there an automated way to continuously populate the graphs for each zone in the Argus system without having to select the data to be shown each time? That sounds like a user question. <laughs> she knows what she's asking. Uh, I'll, I'll take that, but Rico can probably answer it better. Uh, I uh, absolutely, we, we have what we call our saved graphs and, and you can customize that and give your graph a name and then you can just hit that uh, setting each time and that particular graph with whatever uh, parameters you put in it will come up each time. So that I, I'm just going to, that's a long way of saying the answer is yes. And, and Chris, I noticed there's a question from, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, I think it was uh, someone who was asking about how to lubricate uh, louvers. 
I was going to get to that one. That was a little okay. bit, slight, only slightly off topic. And I was going to ask you, Brad. Oh, how, and, I, and I, I was just going to say, that is a great question. And I hope someone knows the answer because we have the same issue and, and we really struggle with that. So the question is, is my audio better now? I want to make sure you can, you can hear yeah. me. All right. I'm, so I apologize for the, for the garbledness there. I'm not saying anything worth hearing anyway. So, so these guys you want to hear. Stacy asked, do you have recommendations for keeping vents operating smoothly? Because I'll tell you what, when your vent jams, man, it doesn't matter how fancy anything else is, you're out of luck. Um, uh, any good lubricant and how often should it be applied? Uh, anybody know? Maybe some I would recommend in. that they go back to the manufacturer of their where they, you know, their vents and see what they recommend. You know, the, the that's just, you know, put on by the greenhouse manufacturer. And we'll... Right. Rico, you know anything? You're too busy with the uh, volt meter and. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, I'm afraid the uh, lubricants are out of my realm of knowledge. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Do we have, we had, uh, Sam wants to know, can you address preventative maintenance from the irrigation perspective? So they're just talking about boilers all the time. Um, I can take that one or, or Brad, you know, you should, I think you should take that one. Well, I, I just would just talk about the, the really basic things like, uh, you know, like, like your, your, lines we, we actually uh, winterize some greenhouses so we actually blow out a lot of our irrigation systems and and we're we're planning to treat those this year uh, with some some uh, some chemicals to try to clean up some of the algae that's in those uh, but but for for sure all, all of their, their there's so many uh, uh, spray tips involved in a in like a boom system and and those have to be addressed you know spray chips and filters and i'm not saying anything new that people don't know but those are just just always key components that seem to fail if you're talking about a, a flood floor system uh some of the things that we do is, is we do actually clean out our tanks we go through a a confined space entry permit system to do that we take that very seriously from a safety point of view but we do uh clean out our our, our flood tanks uh usually uh, twice a year, but it, it does depend. We do assess how, how bad they are. All right, and last question. It sort of relates to the one I was poking at Joan and Rico about and didn't get anywhere with, but uh, and that is ROI, return on investment. What's typical for uh, integrated uh, environmental control? Uh, I can go ahead and take that one. Uh, to Joan's point, a lot of it is going to depend on how much equipment is, is in there. And, uh, you know, the size of your facility is also important to think about for ROI, but it's quite common that people have paybacks uh, within uh, a year with environmental control systems. Wow. Brad, what's your experience? You've, you've got a system, you've got 22 acres. Was it a big mistake to put it in? No, absolutely not. You're never uh, going to see the money back out of it. Oh no, no, no. I mean, it's a, uh, it, 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 it's there. There's a lot of financial gain to it, but you know, it also comes down to getting your life back. Uh, uh, I mean, if if you've ever and, and and years ago, you would you would go over to the greenhouse in the morning, turn on the furnaces. You'd go back at night and 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 excuse me, turn them off, and then you'd come back at night and turn them on, and it was it was a constant. Uh, Thing. it was seven days a week and you had to make sure you had it uh you know had it going and and that that's that's fine when you have a couple of hoop houses but 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 even then it it, it gets it gets old and and it, and you just can't you, you miss one time and you lose a crop or you, or you damage a crop and so i i think it's it, it does give you just a a way better vision of how to run your greenhouse and and keep keep it is in the end it is all about the plants and they will let you know if they're you're not treating them right okay here's a, uh, a last question um that kind of might relate to that harley's asking and and i wasn't quite sure what he meant but he added a little uh, description to it that helps can computer controls can environmental computer predict points of diminishing returns the example being say your heating costs under 
specific weather conditions. You know what he's driving at? And can you answer that? Like when you're just heating too much and it's not doing you any good, and you're wasting oil, in other words, or gas, this could be a way for the machine, the computer to pay itself back. Um, from the Argus controls perspective, uh, there's various ways in which you can decide to get that information. Really what it comes down to is a lot of data. So you're gonna to need to understand the, the usage of whatever your energy requirements are. Um, you know, whether you're talking about uh, kilowatt hours, you're talking about your fuel usage and, and so on and so forth, that's all data, okay? Then you have the environmental control data and you have the data of the different equipment that's kicking on and off or modulating or doing whatever it's, it's doing. So uh, at some point, what you would need to do is uh, either develop an analytical tool or take in that data yourself and basically decide how you want to decipher uh, what makes sense to do and not do based on your energy requirements. And when you have um, easy transfer of data, like on the Argus system, for example, we have something that's called an API out. So what an API out does is it allows for someone to extract data uh, from our data sets uh, within the Argus control system. So if you have someone who's able to write code, they can auto-populate any data that's out of the Argus system and put it into different software, put it into analytical tools or what, or whatever it is that you need to do. So if you took that, your environmental data and the data that you had on your equipment, turning on, turning off, opening, closing, modulating, doing whatever it's doing, and then you also had the data set that was coming from your energy company and you were to consolidate those into one data set and put analytics tools behind it, you absolutely would be able to, to do that. Is that something that's standardly done through a control system? Um, if you had enough inputs and uh, you know did a bunch of custom programming, you could certainly build a tool like that. I wouldn't say that it's not really standard though. <laughs> So it's not 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 built in, but you get to get to work on that as soon as we're done here, Rico. It sounds like a great idea. Yeah. What's yeah, it yeah. costing me to run this greenhouse? That should be a screen, right, Brad? <laughs> it could yeah, be. Exactly. It could be. But you know, I, I would say just in a in a in a in a in a practical way, I know we're going over here, but you know, in a practical way, the the at least this art the Argus system, and I'm sure other systems as well, allow you to uh, at least stage certain, like, like we also have unit furnaces and you can stage certain unit fur furnaces and you can also give them a, a, uh, I'll call it a, a, a parameter where they, they don't come on right at the, at the temperature set point. They, they come on, you, you can set how, how big of a, a swing you want to allow. And, and that I feel like, uh, is a great tool in managing the amount of energy you're, you're using, uh, I always say to our growers, uh, I'm, I'm your low cost supplier of heat, but I want them to set the temperatures. And so we, we, we try to share that, that responsibility of, of growing the crop, but yet doing it as cheaply as possible. All right, great. Well, let's wrap up there. However, Stacy, I hope you're still on the line. I think I saw your name there because we got an answer for you about vent loop. Brad, you paying attention? Joseph, um, who I think we answered one of his questions, he says Viscatine lubricant produced by WINS, W-I-N-N-S. Remember you used to get the stickers and put them on your bicycle? With, uh, it is tacky and it doesn't dry. It's similar to a bicycle chain lube. He uses it on the racks and pinions of his vest. So Viscatine, V-I-S-C-O-T-E-N-E. -E. Order yours today. Probably available on Amazon. All right. <laughs> well, with that, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joan and Brad and Rico, for the great information. Um, I'm sure if uh, anyone has questions, Rico, how do they get in touch with you at Argus uh, if they've got more questions, more specifics about uh, about a system? Yeah, you know, a great way to get in touch with me personally would be uh, via my email. So my email is uh, rgray at argoscontrols.com. Otherwise, if they have any more information uh, about this webinar specifically, they can get in touch also with our marketing department, which would be uh, through uh, Alex Furman. I'm happy to send that uh, information out to, to Grower Talks here. All right. And there is at rgray at argus.com, G-A-R-A-Y. And uh, yeah, if you want to go back into this uh, webinar and, uh, and relive some of the, the highlights, like when my voice got really garbled, I've got to get a new microphone. 
apparently. Uh, or if you had to leave early, or if you want to share it with your colleagues or your boss and say, boss, we need one of these, uh, it's going to be archived, gosh, hopefully within the next uh, half hour to an hour, if I uh, get to it, at growtalks.com slash webinars, which is the exact same place you signed up. Uh, we try to make it as easy as possible. So that said, I want to, again, thank you, uh, Joan. Thank you, Brad, Rico, and all your colleagues at Argus. And I want to thank all my, uh, my peeps here at Ball Publishing who work hard so I don't have to. Uh, with that, I want to say so long, everybody, and uh, we'll see you at the next Grower Talks webinar. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye.